work it, make it, do it, make sense. So, uh, hi. You're here to hear about home automation in practice, I think. So, let's get on with it. But first off, who am I? Well, I'm Dan. Most of the people know me here as one of the organizers of DevOps, but here, I'm not here as a CTO of uh, Adaptivist. I'm here actually more as a technologist. I decided my house was rather dumb. I saw other people playing with cool stuff, and I thought, I want to play with cool stuff too. So here's me as my role as a hacker and a maker. I've been hacking homes and things for years, so I spend money so you don't have to. It's really what this is all about. Uh, this isn't a serious talk at all. I'm going to get no value out of watching this back on YouTube. Really, this is... A, this talk does get ranty, it gets rather frustrating, because it has been a really frustrating journey. But really what I want to do is give people a sense of what's possible with the things that are out there on the market. So there's many things that you can do, there's loads of different technologies out there, and I had a few uh, people come up to me and said, what are you doing, why are you doing this, uh, what about security, can, what should I buy? I want to cover the important topics like security, privacy, protocols, uh, hubs, <laughs> so many hubs in your house. Uh, but we're not going to talk about building your own devices or hubs. So if you're here hoping to hear about rewiring your house or playing with mains electricity, this is not the talk for you. I try not to die. Uh, rule number one, do not be on fire. I took that very seriously. This is a conversation about really what's available commercially, what you can plug and play with. I really wanted my wife to be able to control my house as well as me, because I spend enough of my life fixing people's laptops in my family, and I don't want to be fixing my house too. Hopefully we'll end up with some use cases that will give you a good idea about the things that I've achieved, how I've done it, and at least give you a sense of what I did to do it. And you can do it the same way and have all the same fun, but this, this isn't going to be a deep dive into code. Um, we do have a bit of code, but just not much. Enough to show you why you, I really wish I didn't have to code this stuff. If you do want to learn about OpenHTTP and you want to, there's a talk called Talk to Your Home. Uh, it was done uh, by Joost Dunbar. I've completely butchered his name. I apologize if you're in the room. Uh, but he did a talk at DevOps last year and uh, on talking to my home. Go along to here and uh, you can figure out all the different tools and stuff that he used for that. But we're going to take a different path. This is the story of my journey, and I, I do apologize if it's incoherent, because it will be incoherent. And in fact, I'm going to skip slides, because this is just me having a conversation with you as people who are interested in the space, rather than me trying to produce something nice and polished. So I'm happy to share any detail or give me questions afterwards. I'm going to be around. So if, if any of this ignites an idea in your mind or a thought as to, hey, what about this? Do come and talk to me after. So before the what comes the why. Well, it should do. So I wanted to get peace of mind. I wanted to build a house that I could understand. <laughs> Damn it, did I leave the oven on? Did I lock the front door? I want to be able to answer the simple questions of, oh, damn it, did I leave the window open? The things when you're driving down the M6 on your holiday for two weeks, and you're like, damn it, did I do X? I also wanted it to be more secure. We're getting all this data about my house. Uh, have you ever heard, been in bed and you hear a creak downstairs? I now know if someone's downstairs. Probably the cat. I also wanted to save money. Uh, I, I didn't quite work out how I wanted. Um, I, I'll explain a bit more later. But ultimately, really what I cared about was being the developer that I am. I want to be lazy. I don't want to have to think about a lot of the stuff that I do to get me to where I want to be to do the stuff I need to do. So I started off with the, the premise that my house isn't very talkative, so I need more data so I can do stuff. So how do I get data? So if we have a look at the a range of different things that we can do with home automation, it looks roughly like this. I mean, this is an image I sold to the internet. Thank you, internet. Um, but if we start off at the top, we can see that we're covering things like music, garage doors, blinds and curtains, locks and alarms, heating and CCTV, lighting and presence detection, entertainment and sprinklers, electrical outlets. All of these can be controlled by buttons, apps, and voice. But before we go into each of these areas, let's talk about some platform commonalities. Holy crap. 
Wireless protocols. I thought this was a solved problem. Apparently, it's not. You, you can, they split basically into two different types of networks that you'll end up in your house. You'll have Wi-Fi, and you'll have Mesh. Mesh is built up of a set of different networks, depending on which company, depends on which one they choose. Yay, who knew? Uh, so we have Lightwave that runs on 430 megahertz. We, uh, and a genie likes this, so um, anytime you get pick up any of the energy, it's pretty much only energy like this, unfortunately. It looked like it was a great direction, and then people came up with Z-Wave, or Z-Wave, but everyone calls it Z-Wave. And Z-Wave Plus, which is kind of compatible, but not really. Uh, uh, Z-Wave runs at 900 megahertz, because it's double, it must be twice as good, right? But smart things, Piper, things like that will run on this frequency. Uh, smart things is from Philips, and we'll see a lot about that later. Zigbee is the main competitor to Z-Wave, and things run uh, probably both at the same time. Lots of devices run on, on both of those protocols, especially hubs. But typically, when you buy a sensor, it'll be in one of these protocols. Um, my gut has now been to go for Z-Wave or Zigbee, because I've got enough hubs that I can talk to just about anything. There is another one, which is Thread which is uh, 2.4 gigahertz, and that's done uh, by Google Nest. And that actually looks like a really interesting protocol. But it's a different protocol. Then there's Wi-Fi. Of course, Wi-Fi. And you have lots of devices that actually just connect to the network. And you have hubs that talk on the network to their devices, but you also have hubs that just bridge into that. I think I've figured out I have 15 wireless networks running in my house. I think. I can't find them all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, debugging wireless networks is freaking hard, and uh, debugging Wi-Fi is hard enough. Um, but Belkin, Belkin, Sonos, Harmony, all these will sit on your Wi-Fi network, and you don't have to worry about that too much. I kind of wish more did, but it's really energy inefficient. And until we start wiring our house with 5-volt connections everywhere and having those drop down by lights, I think that will be the point, point at which we can actually solve some of these problems. But we're not there yet. So we have this, and thank you, Randall, for... <laughs> Epitomizing my hell in, uh, in a nice little cartoon. Uh, anyone who's not seen this, this is how standards uh, cre uh, create and how they proliferate. Because we're going to do everything everyone else does. And then someone else does one more thing. So if you want to go about, um, about start buying some of this stuff, I strongly suggest you go and have a look at this. This breaks down the key components and the benefits of each of these protocols and gives a much better articulation than I just have about why you choose each. So it's the best one I've found so far. Um, it covers their support. More importantly, it covers the trade-offs. And actually, at the end of it, you'll probably end up with most of them. But at least you'll have an appreciation of why you're in the hell you are. <laughs> so what's, what have I done? What, what, what have I actually completed? Well, I have completed some stuff, kind of. I've um, started off with uh, Sonos, which is freaking addictive and gets very expensive very quickly. You buy one little speaker, you sit in the corner, and you realize you can play apps to it. And you, start, you can play music from any of your phones. And you're like, yay. And then you go, oh, I need another one, and another one. And you realize you've got 22 in your house. Oh, I don't know how that happened. Um, you could also use Amazon Echo that does play music rather badly. Um, Google Home, too, the speaker's crap. But you can just plug them into any number of Bluetooth speakers out there. Um, I just chose Sonos because... Frankly, I was doing this talk, so I can write it off against tax. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, my main issue with actually these is if I'm talking to Alexa, which came out pretty much far down my track, I, have to, I either have to have Spotify or I have to have uh, Amazon's own music service. But I don't. I'm on Apple Music, and I'm happy with Apple Music. It sits on my phone. It's nice. But no, I have to pay for it all over again. And what's worse, Spotify doesn't even have the music I want. <laughs> it's on Apple. Because oh, I used Apple uh, Tunes Match, and yeah, damn it. So I moved quickly on to stop myself from getting depressed. And uh, so I think if I'm going to leave my house, and it happened that I was going to leave my house last month, I ended up spending two and a half months in America last year, yay! Uh, but what about my house? Um, I need my house to be aware of what's going on. And so Piper was one of my first pur purchases. Uh, basically, it's an all in one box. It has uh, an inbuilt PIR sensor, so that's this thing here, a motion sensor, um, it presence. Uh, it's got a standard and an infrared camera, and uh, it does motion-based with cloud recording. It's got a microphone and a speaker in there. The speaker's really useful if you want to scare the cat. And uh, a painfully loud alarm, which can wake people up accidentally. Uh, it's great for security purposes, and it's purpose-built app that uh, um, is unfortunately really isolated, but it does 
cover all of the things I need. I can look at my Piper and see what's going on in my different rooms. From a security perspective, it's really useful. But unfortunately, it's really isolated and doesn't integrate well. Getting events out of it and putting triggers into it is, and we'll, we'll talk about going on holiday and my routine later. Smart thermostats uh, fit into the heating area. Um, I, there is Nest and Energy Knee smart radiator valves, but I've settled with Hive because I have a hot water tank. And uh, at the time, Hive was the only one that supported uh, hot water tanks. Uh, now I believe Nest supports open therm. I have no idea if my water tank supports open therm. It doesn't have it written on it, and it's full of ladding, and I don't fancy ripping it off to find out. But anyway, Hive is pretty dumb. and It's, it's basically just a replacement for your old thermostat and controller unit. It still uses schedules, but I want to do less scheduling. I want to be, be more articulate about my interactions. I want to say I want to have three showers a day uh, in the morning, and I want to be able to have two baths at night because that's how my house works. Can you just make sure there's enough hot water at those times? Can you just make sure I, I don't get in the shower and halfway through I'm frozen? That's we'll talk about how I managed to achieve that or not later. Lighting is the most addictive. My wife, uh, yes, bless her, she, she, she loves all of our lights, and some people in this room have seen what we've done to our front room. I've got 10 lights in my front room now. I kid you not, you end up, it, it gets pretty crazy with light strips and light bulbs and sticking them everywhere. It's, it's good fun. Um, actually, it's a great talking point and the kids are absolutely in love with it. But actually I found it, once we were able to set scenes and able to actually influence the color of our lights and the dimming and have it respond to the type of activity we're doing, it actually started to complement the stuff pretty damn well. Unfortunately, it's freaking expensive. And we wanted one app that did everything for it. So while there are lots and lots of different lighting systems, we went for Philips Hue. It's expensive. It's about 50 pounds of a color light. And when you rack up that I've got 25 lights in my five bedroom house and 14 switches, you start having to look for bulk buy <laughs> options because it gets very expensive very quickly. We wanted one app to do everything that, so that you could just pick it up. Because the biggest problem we had when we tried the lighting with separate vendors was I was having to go and pick up three different apps in order to figure out which one do I turn the light on. And you know what? By then, you just turn the light switch. <laughs> the whole idea was to make it easy. And uh, uh, yeah, Philips Hue has really l um, put a lot of focus into their app. The problem I have is that while it uses uh, the light, um, the Zigbee and uh, Z um, Zigbee uh, home automation and light link networks. The real challenge that I had was that it doesn't communicate when light switches are pushed. And we'll see why that's a problem later. So it's all iso isolated on its own network. And oh, and in case anyone, <laughs> the marketing doesn't tell you that you can only have 24 lights in the network, and we have 25. So yeah, we, we, we have to go around and turn one off so we can turn another on. So I need to get two hubs, and I've not yet figured out how on earth am I going to have two hubs in my house. And how are they going to talk to each other? And what happens, do, do I have two different apps now, and I have to remember which room I'm in? <laughs> Make this easy for me. Um, I, so I think, and I say I think, that this has made my house actually more energy efficient because... It means that I've got my lights being turned off more. I can dim them, and actually they're LEDs, so they're more efficient. But the way that Hue lights work, they're plugged in to the light socket, and they're on all the time. So they're connected to the wireless network all the time. So I've got 25 devices always on. So that's going to take more electricity than the lights being off. But my, my bill at the end of the month is lower. So either I've saved a lot, and but I, don't, I just don't know. Unfortunately, if you don't have a smart meter in your home, you pretty much can't find out either. Uh, my brother has a smart meter, and we tried it at his house, and it's intelligent enough to know which of the lights in your house you've left on. So if you, get, if you can get a smart heat meter, do, but unfortunately, there's no way to actually buy a smart meter. They just have to come around and enable it at some point. Sensors. Uh, Sensors are great, especially when combined with lighting. Uh, so uh, I, I picked a bunch of these. And I picked a bunch of these purely because they did the four out of the, 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 I, out of the six things they do, I needed to do four. I could have picked a bunch of sensors. I could have built it myself. 
but for about forty pounds, you can pick one of these up, and it worked out that about uh, uh, for about fifteen pounds and um, some blood, sweat, and tears, I could build one myself. But I like my blood, sweat, and tears to stay in my body, so I bought it instead. Uh, so if you buy these, you'll get presents, uh, which is really it's a con in my mind because it doesn't really tell you presents. What I really want, I want a sensor that tells me when someone's in the room. But it doesn't tell me when someone's in the room. It tells me have someone moved in the re room recently. <laughs> and that's not the same thing. It's definitely not the same thing if you're sat in the bath. <laughs> if you've, <laughs> yeah, I, you've never lived until you've been woken up 2 a.m., gone down to the bathroom, take a, st especially as men standing up and urinating, and then the lights go out. It's not a pleasant place to be. Nor is having uh, guests go, Dan, <laughs> I can't see. Uh, yes, uh, fumbling around for toilet paper in the dark. I learned very quickly, this stuff has to work. It has to be reliable, and it has to be fail safe. You have to fail and work. And uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, people kept turning the lights off, so I went around and put tape on it to stop people turning the lights off. It meant they couldn't turn them on either. Oops. So, um, so pre presence will detect when you're there, but you'll, you have to keep moving in order for it to work. So that means you need lots of sensors. So don't just put one sensor in the bathroom. Luminance tells you when it's light, but unfortunately, there's quite a lag on it. So when the light's off, it's dark. And so, uh, so my use case for luminance was at, uh, at 5 p.m. when the sun's going down, I probably want the light on a bit. But in the middle of the day, I probably don't need a light on at all. So don't bother turning the light on if I wouldn't have needed to turn the light on to see. I wanted to express that I, I, don't, I shouldn't care about lighting. I shouldn't need to think about lighting. I should be able to do the thing I'm wanting to do and see. And the moment you don't start thinking about lighting and you just do your thing you're looking for rather than trying to find the light switch as it's dark, that's the moment you're doing it right. The problem with luminance is that the lag in the sensors is about 12 seconds when they're on batteries. So rule number one, wire them all in with power. Hence going back to, I wish houses had five volts everywhere. But if you uh, don't plug them in, about every 12 seconds it'll tell you the luminance. Thing is, when you turn the light on, it gets brighter. So it thinks, oh, I don't need to be on anymore, and it turns itself off. And <laughs> we went through a phase of uh, one of my development cycles where you go into a room and the lights would just go up and down, up and down, up and down. It was really frustrating if you were reading a book. Yeah. So. Be careful, calibrate it. Oh, and in bathrooms, again, um, mist. Uh, I figured out this late, that mist actually reduces the depth of, which, of the field it can see, which is really annoying, because when you're in the shower, there's a lot of mist. <laughs> and uh, yes, so shower, um, and we usually have a shower in the morning. We have baths at night, typically, but uh, we went on a fun run recently. And uh, in the evening, I need to have a shower. Turns out that showering in the dark is a harder experience than you'd think. So, yeah, bugs, bugs in life. Um, oh, yes, oh, fi finally, uh, watch out for the wireless networks. So our downstairs bathroom is, as most, um, behind the kitchen. So betwe um, directly between our bathroom and the hub, turns out that there is this massive Faraday cage called a fridge and freezer, and they were blocking uh, one out of nine. Every time I went to the bathroom, it was absolutely fine, but every so often you have people say, yeah, I get a text message going, can you turn the lights on? Which is great, because I can. <laughs> but but <laughs> I'm done with support. Um, and uh, yeah, so watch out how far you are away from devices. and spread. Again, you're going to be debugging wireless networks. So we'll go into this later with one of uh, my use cases. But I wanted to have a nice living room. I wanted to be able to come in and be a bit more articulate to my living room. So with entertainment, I purchased a Harmony remote. It's both a hub, which is this little black box at the bottom. That's an infrared blaster. It does both infrared and Bluetooth, and it can control things for you. Uh, I also picked up the remotes, because I very quickly worked out that people just reach for the remote. And that does some really bad things and good things, which we'll talk about later. But giving them a remote that does the thing that they want to and just does it intuitively so they can just push volume up or they can push the off button was really important, especially for people that aren't members of your household. How, how often have you been to a friend's house and they've had to train you on how to use the light switch? Yeah, we can't do that. 
So there's a lot of stuff that we take for granted, a lot of behaviors that you have to hook into. And again, I wasn't going to play with mains electricity, and so I had to figure out how I do this on top of it. Sonos for my music, in this case, is the surround sound system. And uh, uh, I've got an Apple TV that I use for playing Netflix. I've got uh, an Xbox, which I play for games. And uh, I've got Sky, which just records, I use it for Formula One mainly, and the news when I feel like being depressed. Electrical outlets. I, I thought I'd need lots of these. And uh, actually, I bought, uh, I've, I've got a lot of these spare. So if anyone wants to play with them, feel free. I, just let me know. I can give them to you, because I've got no use for these at the moment, apart from in two cases. I found they're useful for Christmas tree lights and exterior lights, because those are not going to be hooked up into hue. They're going to be the things that are plugged in the wall, and you turn off and on at night. And you probably want them on a timer. And so actually, that works quite well. Uh, yeah, that, uh, Christmas was only like three months into this journey, and so I only figured out that was useful three months in. Um, also, <laughs> anyone who's had their internet go down at home or has figured out that you need to reboot a hub, you can't get it to reboot itself, because once you tell it to go off, there's no way to tell it to go on again. So out-of-band hub restarts become a big thing, and so my Energini plugs basically just restart everything else. You've never lived until you've had to reboot your house. But... I'm keeping calm because I'm not done yet. I have more things to go. Uh, I, I have a garage. It's full of stuff that I don't look at and should probably get rid of, but uh, I do have a garage. And uh, uh, there are definitely interesting options, but this fell into the mechanical bracket. I'm going to have to get a door. And this can go wrong pretty majorly. And uh, if anyone heard of uh, the case where the guy uh, blew up on Twitter saying, ah, my energy, uh, sorry, my, uh, I, can't, I forget the, the uh, company's name, but my garage door doesn't work, your app's shit. So, he, so the app owner locked him out of his garage. <laughs> yeah, that can happen. Uh, it, it got resolved within like a couple of days, but uh, yeah, b be careful about being mean on Twitter to the people that basically run your house. Uh, <laughs> they, they can do bad stuff. Um, uh, but yes, so I, I don't go into my garage often enough that I've not tried doing this. And also, if it breaks down, I can't get to my stuff. And actually, failing safe, I need to get to my stuff. Uh, the other thing I've not done is uh, blinds and curtains, because there are uh, many interesting options. Uh, this is possibly the cheapest uh, Wi-Fi automated blind, but um, probably not the best. Um, you can get something more like this. This is what I want, but um, yeah, you can go, you can, I mean, Feel free to lift this image, put it into Google Images, and you'll see the price, and it's eye-wateringly expensive. So I'm not doing that yet. Um, door locks is actually probably the next thing I'm going to do. Uh, but unfortunately, I've got an old wooden front door. It's not got a Yale lock. It's not got a night latch, uh, which uh, I've not got one shown, actually. And I've not got a five-point either, which is the PVC doors with the lock. Most of the secure ones that I found out there, the ones, because this, the, this is your house to get into, I wanted to make sure it's accredited. And so the Yale Key Free Connected Smart Lock does everything that I want it to, well, kind of, but you just need a compatible door. So if you have a five point lock, I, if we already had one, I'd have had this now. And uh, also, I'd have had uh, this up in the top right, which is a smart doorbell. I want to be able to see when someone knocks on my door. Um, but it turns out if you've got a doorbell, people push the doorbell before knocking on the door. And so people end up saying, hey, have you actually tried knocking the door? Someone's in. <laughs> Just knock on the door. It's OK. I, I, I'm in, I'm not, I don't want to be in meetings and answering the door to delivery people. But what we can do is tell them, here's the pin code. You can put it in the porch. And I want it to be, because it doesn't do quite what I want. So I want two doors. I want to be able to lock the internal door and open it based on why I open the front door. So if I open the front door because it's a delivery, keep the inner door locked. So they've got this protected, secure area that I can let them into, and they can leave something expensive. And I don't have to worry about that being open all day, as someone who gives it a go will just be able to open it up and take what they see. But if I've let a friend in, I've given the PIN number, I do want them to get into the house. And sometimes I want to be able to open the inner door selectively. So if I've had a tradesman come around, and they say, hey, hey I've dropped this stuff, but didn't you want me to pick some stuff? Oh, damn it, I left it in the front room. I could then let them in. This is the sort of stuff I want to do, and it's not quite there yet. And uh, so it's not what I want to use yet, so I'm, I'm going to hold off a little bit. There are some sensors that we're not using. Uh, one of the sensors uh, is Windows, and that's mainly because they're too expensive. It's about £25 a sensor, and I have a lot of Windows. Um, 
you, you don't realize how many things that can open on the outside of your house until you actually go and look at them. But I would love to be able to know now, did I leave the small bedroom little window open or something? Um, and I'd also like to be notified, has something gone wrong? Water damage as well, but it's so low risk. I, I, I would like to know if I've got a leak in the loft. I would like to know if the pipes have frozen and cracked, but the amount of effort I'd have to go to to figure that out is quite high. And frankly, the weather around in England is just too normal. That's not really a big risk. I did have a picture of uh, what goes wrong with a robotic mower, which is there's a guy on the internet and he ran over his dog and gave him a good haircut. And I, yeah, I thought I better not show. But if you're going to see that, they're not clever. It's like, would you let your three-year-old mow your lawn? No, they're they have the intelligence of a three-year-old at the moment. So I, I, I'm, I'm also I don't have a mansion, so I don't have a big garden, so I don't need to worry about this. It takes me four minutes. So, and if you do, perhaps you probably want a gardener anyway and let them figure it out. Oh, sprinklers as well. I just don't have enough grass. So, I didn't anything. So, some use, use cases of uh, the things I've done. So, the entertainment one was uh, uh, the way I started. And with all use cases, you start with a problem statement. So, I want to be able to say to my system, somehow, the intent of the thing I want to do. I don't want to even turn the TV on and turn the Xbox and change the source. I want to say... I want to continue watching Doctor Who. It should know where I was up to and play the next episode. In fact, if you look at Netflix and iPlayer, they kind of do that already, but you still have to get to the point of iPlayer being on in the first place. All the components kind of are there, but not just. So I want to define the target state, and I want to adapt based on the current conditions. So if I was on the Xbox, you're going to need to change the source. If, I was, if we're going to be putting Radio 2 on, I'm going to need to turn TV off. So depending on what state the, the room is in at the time, I need to change and update. Biggest issue I found with this is remote controls because people having remote controls can change the TV itself and the system's not aware of it. I talked about rebooting your house and it's actually a big pain because you need to make sure that the sensors come on after the lighting system and anything that can change state because the sensors change the state to something new. And if they think they've turned the TV on, everything's out of whack. And every time you try to turn the TV on, it turns it off. And that's frustrating. It's really frustrating when someone who's sat there trying to use it doesn't know what's gone wrong. And so I'm tech support again. So if we, I want to rate it. I, I want to do things like, during the evening, I want more light than I do during the day. Unless I'm watching a movie, in which case, dim the lights. I want to avoid reflections from the ceilings. Unless I'm watching the, uh, the news, in which case, I don't really care. Because I care more about the message they're giving me. Sometimes, actually, I might want to be reading, and so turn some stuff off. Uh, if the TV is, uh, needs its input changing, I want to be able to figure out what has to happen. Sound sometimes needs to be surround. Sometimes volume needs to be changed, because actually the input level that you get from an Xbox is different to that from Sky, and pretty much every show on Netflix is a different volume level. <sighs> okay. um, so I want to be able to do stuff about intent. So um, plug it into Alexa. And you need to be specific and intuitive and reactive. Ideally, I want to do no text-based stuff. So the technology is really important. The things that I, I said before, we have Sonos, and that's dealing with our sound. Uh, plug that into Alexa, and there's an Alexa skill, which lets you control a third of what it does. But <laughs> at least it knows what you're trying to do. So you can say, uh, so I've plugged it in with you know me. And you know me is a bit like if this then that, so it's a text. It's not. It's a visual programming uh, system that allows you to say if this happens. In this case, uh, turn uh, turn the Xbox on. I, I want to play on the Xbox, or so you, you put in the permutations of the commands you want to say to it. It will then know that the TV needs to be on. Turn it into the correct state. It will then know to wait. And this is harmony that knows to wait 20 seconds for the TV to turn itself on. And then it will go off and change the channel to the Xbox. And then the Xbox will turn on because the power's gone down the HDMI cable. This took me about a weekend to figure out how to turn the damn thing on. It then took me another uh, two weekends to figure out what else, uh, how to change the state between them. But with a combination of Harmony, you know me, and uh, Alexa and Sonos, it was able to do all of it.
And I did, had to do no programming. It was all done through the apps. Found it quite easy, but it was definitely a debugging loop of let me change this extra thing. I can't convert with Alexa properly. I can't say, show me the next Doctor Who app, uh, episode. What I can say is turn the iPlayer on, and it'll go off and do that. It's almost impossible for it to figure out what, and to show me the next Doctor Who episode, because what I really want is for it to figure out where that would be. So if I'm wanting to watch the next Doctor Who episode, if I'm all up to date, I want it to figure out when the next Doctor Who episode is and go and record it for me. I want it to technology to get out of the way and stop asking me to figure out what I need to do and just do it for me. What I really want is a personal assistant, and it's not there yet, but it's not very far off. So if uh, all the media companies, if they can get them to learn one thing, it's to get your act together. Media licensing is a hellhole. I have to have Netflix, Sky, and a ton of other different things in order to be able to watch the set of things I want to see. It's really hard for me to be able to get hold of media, be it music or video or uh, TV or movies, because it's split across all these different systems. Better rights management and licensing is really needed to break these barriers down so I can get the content I'm looking for. It's being delivered in a better medium now. It's not just being drip fed to me on a, a daily basis or a weekly basis. But I could pay £2,000 a month to all the possible media providers out there and still have a really poor experience. And that's not great. If you're wondering why people pirate, it's because of this mess. But with lighting, I wanted it to be reactive. I just wanted to forget about it. As I said before, lighting isn't the thing that you should think about. It should be just there. So it should be automatic, and it should just happen. It should adapt to conditions, time of the day, time of the year, weather. If it's overcast, we, hey, it could be middle of summer, and we still need the lights on at 5 p.m. because we've got a black cloud. That's more often than not. It doesn't always need to be on. Sometimes it can be dim. It just needs to balance it to have an acceptable light in the room. Sometimes you want to change the color temperature. So towards the evening, you probably want to make it a warmer light so that you get rid of the blue spectrum, as that's been shown, at least in some studies, to affect sleep cycles. But the problem is rule zero. Don't wake the wife. I don't want to get up in the middle of the night and all the lights come on. That's bad. Or worse, don't wake the baby. That's bad. If it's too, you want to make sure that the lights come on, and if it's uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, they come on quite dimly. In fact, maybe the, uh, you want a night light around the children's areas. You don't want it too dark, though, so you can't see where you're going, because that defeats the object. Failure in the system shouldn't be critically impactful. It should be able to just work still. I should be able to reach for a light switch and turn it on. One of the things I like about the Philips system is that the worst thing is you turn it off and you turn it on, and it comes back on bright. Wait the wife and then deal with the consequences. Using the bathroom while sleepy is tough enough, but using while blind is just asking for trouble. And you have to make sure that people coming into your house can just follow those things and just make it work. What we've ended up doing is getting 3D printed uh, covers for our light switches. So you can still get to the light behind it, but all of our digital switches and remotes are on top of it. I mean, it was a fun, funky project, but it's not really ready for most people to deal with. Our main places that we use it are in bathrooms, hallways, and anywhere we really just walk. Uh, the, the, front, uh, the kitchen is really useful too. The sensors are everywhere, and we need them everywhere. Most of the rooms have got at least one sensor. Some have got three or four. Because with a 120 degree view, you need to pick up blind spots. But then you have to be careful that across the hallway, I can end up triggering the bathroom if we leave our doors open from my bed. <laughs> And I don't want to be turning my um, but roll over in my sleep and have left the door open. And turn, uh, you have to be aware of the field of vision that's there. There is a lot of things to help you when you're debugging, and we'll actually get to some code in a second. Um, but uh, once you've uh, set it all up, you can see when they're triggering. You can see a live log of what's going on in your house. And uh, that could be quite useful in determining what's triggering where. And most of them have uh, flashing lights that will tell you what they've seen and where they've seen it. So they'll flash to tell you you're not moving anymore. They'll flash to tell you I've seen you on my periphery, and they'll flash to a different color to tell you I've seen you and I've sent a signal that there's motion. Uh, timers are really useful, but the problem that I've had with the Philips system is that my timers are on my sensors, and that's on SmartThings. So SmartThings says, hey, something moved. Tell the light to turn on. 
problem is someone uh, the the light may have gone off and someone pushed the button to turn the light on or they want to tell it lights go on but because of the security which we'll cover in a bit I can't get that message from the F Philips Hue system into the smarts thing so I can't cancel the timer they're not aware of each other and that's really frustrating and I've actually got to the point now where I'm thinking of building a actual cloud application for my entire damn house and I shouldn't really be there. It's annoying. It's, I really shouldn't because n no one's going to do this. Well, maybe me. So, smart things looks a bit like this. And so, in order to do the timings, I had to go off and create an app. I wanted to pick a bunch of sensors and say when this thing happens. If the light levels are this level, then if it's too dark, then turn the light on. And I want to be able to specify this abstractly and follow decent developer principles. So the first thing we have to do is log in. I can't show you most of this, unfortunately. Uh, not on screen, because wonderfully, uh, all of my device IDs will be seen. <laughs> and I'm not going to put them out on the internet. I'm really sorry. There are some things that we just can't do, uh, or I'm not willing to do. But what I will do is do a demo for you and show you how the app is built. So here we see. Does this work? It does. I wasn't expecting it to work, hence the yay. Okay, so uh, when you log in, uh, I have a list of my locations. Uh, all the other stuff will give you a bunch of IDs. You can come and I'll show you on here if you want to see it. But uh, uh, if I go into the applications, you can see what's actually in my house. Uh, I've installed a bunch of uh, off-the-shelf applications, uh, like Hello Home. It's got, uh, these are routines. So I can say, good morning. I'd never do anymore, but you have a good morning routine, and what that does is set a bunch of things, so it might turn the lighting off or across your house, or good night might shut everything down. Um, house sitting means that all my sensors uh, around my secure area, the areas that a house sitter shouldn't go, so I've got some, uh, my office should be locked, and so the motion sensor in my office should never be triggered when I've got a house sitter in. Um, yeah, uh, uh, things that do stuff, they're just, push a button, and it'll go off and figure out what it needs to do. But this is my one. And so we can see we've got a ton of uh, sensors on the right. They're feeding back uh, a bunch of information. So Lux is your light level. Um, I've got a ton of light sensors. T uh, so I, I, They all have to be named uniquely, and it gets a real bore naming all your devices uniquely. I know some people who just give them names like Bob, Kate, Frank, but I find that really hard. So I end up with really verbose names for mine. So yeah, I'm pretty sure you can guess where those sensors are. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't actually get into that. See? But what we'll do is I'll show you what that app is, because it's this one, the one I wrote. I hate this. This is the worst IDE in the world, uh, because it gives me no development cycle. I am, I'm used to writing REST APIs. I'm used to doing bits of development. I like committing my code into GitHub. I like being able to have some CI tool check that I've done the right thing. I don't get to do that here. In fact, it's all magic. It's, it's wonderful, groovy magic. And I don't really know what I'm not, I, I don't know what I've not done. And you have to figure stuff out. But you're going to, uh, if you follow my path, you're going to end up in this pretty quickly. So to run through quickly, you have a definition at the top, which is self-explanatory. The preference pages. So if I open up this simulator and set the location, it'll eventually give me a preference pane. This is just defining what's in the preference pane. If you've ever built an Android or a uh, iOS app, this is relatively straightforward to you. I hadn't, so this is all new. Um, it, it should be self-explanatory as to what these do, but you want to basically put uh, your inputs into groups. Uh, we have multiple sections. I, end, I wanted to actually build preference panes that were generic. I wanted to say, hey, here's a bunch of sensors. Here's um, the type of room it is. So is it a bathroom or is it a hallway? And here are the lights that are, you want to be affected. It's really hard to do because it's indefinite and because um, it runs uh, on microservices and there's no state handled. So I can't write a curried lambda. I have to end up with 
something along the lines of here, where I'm subscribing tons of different sensors in the different pages. So this is for each of the pages. So room A, room B, room C, and room D. Room A happens to be my downstairs bathroom. And so uh, where it's uh, installed, this gets triggered and initializes, which means that I'm going to now subscribe to the events that happen on all of these sensors. And it's a set of sensors because we have multiple is set to true. So manage the lights in the downstairs bathroom based on these sensors, and I can just tick which ones. The real interesting stuff happens uh, inside of motion detected, which is actually motion detected A, B, C, D, because I can't do currying. So I have to do horrible stuff like that. Uh, but it runs this, and it gives me the room, which is room A, and the event that happened. So I want to know, have someone moved or not moved? Because I want to do two different things. If someone moves, then I want to figure out, is it too dark? And is it too dark is if I've been given a sensor, and I've been given a luminance threshold, because different rooms have different thresholds. So uh, depending on where you put the sensor, depends on how much light it sees in the room. So you end up with a ton of calibration fun. But assuming you've got that, we can figure out, is it too dark? So if it is too dark, then it'll turn the lights on. Yay! And it should turn it on and be on. I set the threshold for 20 minutes. So if no events fire to say you've stopped moving because of Faraday cages and stuff, then it will be, uh, uh, then it'll go off after 20 minutes. But uh, if you become inactive, oh sorry, if it's not too dark and you've moved, then it won't do anything, it won't turn the lights off. But if you stop moving, don't turn the lights off when you see someone stop moving. That's really important. Uh, instead, set it to a more reasonable timeout. In this case, two minutes. Uh, what I want to be able to do inside of this motion detected frame is say, unless someone has pushed a button, so if someone's gone into the room and turned the light on, ignore me completely. They've said they want the light on, so leave it on for an hour. And so because they've said they want it on. I, I've not figured out how to do that yet. And then all these loggings, all the logging. I'll show you the logging, but it's, it's quite interesting because I can get, you get a stream of data. I know people are in my house right now, and it'll be spinning off the screen. But the log, uh, there's no breakpoints. There's no way to see what's going on in your house. So you just have this ton of logging data that you just comment out most of the time. It's frustrating. Uh, yeah, that's all I can say about that. Oh, but that's the code. Uh, this was in case the internet didn't work, and I couldn't show you that. Uh, so, yeah, you get logging like this. I've, uh, I, I had to take a screenshot because, fortunately, they get all the device IDs. And the device IDs, you can hack my house, so please don't do that. So I blurred them out. Please don't do anything bad to my house. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, effectively what this is doing is just getting a hit on the downstairs bathroom light. Uh, 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 we're seeing that a, a command uh, passed with motion. Uh, th that was it going inactive. Where are we? I should have really looked at this before I put it up. But <laughs> oh yeah, you, you end up with silly things like the downstairs bathroom no longer exists. <laughs> no, no, it does. <laughs> it's the house there a minute ago. I know it really does. You have some really, it's really good therapy, and you find yourself talking to yourself a lot, and it becomes really abstract. So if anyone ha decides to hack into my Alexa, I'm pretty sure they could section me under the Mental Health Act, because there's some really weird conversations you end up having with yourself trying to figure this out. So challenges. The sensors suck. They really do. They don't really do what I want. What they do is they gather the information that they can find. They don't answer the question I really have. And that makes building stuff really hard. Especially with wireless networks, they're just unreliable, and it's all UDP stuff. So your sensor just goes, hey, I saw you, and then, OK. No, there's no check that you got that. If you didn't get that, well, never mind. <laughs> and that can be really, really painful. Uh, the development cycle is just hideous. And uh, yeah, we need switches. I have more switches in my house now than I had before. That was the opposite of what I was hoping for. And yeah, again, stay away the hell away from mains. Don't die. So going away, what can we do when we leave our house? Well, I did 10 weeks in America. The house sitter comes sometimes. And I'm a traveler. And my house is empty. But I like my things. So how do I make sure I have things when I come back? So I want to know things like, has the house sitter been? Have they been where they shouldn't? Has the gardener been, because we paid them to? Is my house on fire? 
That'd be really nice to know. Uh, we decided not to go with a, a connected fire alarm because the only one on the market at the time had an open hack where someone had turned it on and off 50,000 times a second and caused a fire. <laughs> the irony of your fire alarm actually setting fire to your house is not lost on the fire crew that were laughing at them. Uh, the, has my car been stolen? So I have a little fob in my car. You take it and I know. Uh, has there been an intrusion? Uh, but I don't really care most I don't care most of this about most of my stuff, but my tech is hidden away. So, because I've gone away, I'd collected all the important pieces of technology and hid them in a cupboard that, and put stuff in front of the cupboard. Had that been opened, because then I know I'm <laughs> someone's taken a lot of my money. Piper is how I got started. Uh, simple, free, standard lights, uh, just tucked all lights, put plug control, put on timers, just made it look like I was home. The motion sensors, there's a proximity sensor for my car, so I could figure it's still there. Lots of door sensors, are they open or closed? If you leave the door open, sensors too uh, long open, it resets itself, and so when you close it, it now thinks you've opened it. Uh -huh. um, so you, all you, what you end up looking for is state change, rather than what the state is. Uh, out of band plug controls, uh, in case smart things break down, it does, it's rare. Uh, if the internet goes down, I am screwed. But I had to make it easy to power cycle. We had a power cut while I was in America, and I had to talk my mother-in-law how to reboot my house. It was a trial for both of us. Uh, being out of the house is OK, but being out of time zone is really painful. I found that really hard. And people changed their travel plans, and so we had the house sitter setting off alarms, and then I had to get up in the mic and say, don't shut it up, because it is a painfully loud alarm. Uh, I had to make my house much smarter to deal with humans being just humans and unpredictable. Uh, humans mess with stuff, and that's really hard. They don't do it intentionally, but bloody humans. I mean, if you hide, so we hid the remotes, so people could change. They went onto the damn side of the TV and started changing things and unplugging things, and they're like, how do I turn it? I don't know. I don't know what you've done. Just undo it. Put it back, and it should just work. And so I ended up using the camera from my Piper to see my TV so I could try and reprogram my TV from America. That was not a morning I want to go through again. <laughs> Heat efficiency. This is where it gets really ranty, because... I have really simple requirements. It's a, I, I know I, I, we leave our heating on too much because it's dumb. We have to set it to 23 Celsius during the day, and it's on all day, and the temperature is variable, and it only has one point in the room that it can take. It to. So it gets left on a lot, and the time is to set it. I only have two requirements. I don't want to be cold, and I don't want to be poor. It's not that hard, <laughs> but they're also mutually exclusive <laughs> because <laughs> I can leave my heating on all the time, but then I'll be poor. I can turn it off all the time, but then it'll be cold. Each house is very different and has lots of different rooms. And each room is occupied at different times. Presence is predictable, mostly, so I know when I'm going to be in my office. I know I'm not usually in my office at 6 o'clock in the morning. Exceptions are telegraphed, usually, by an event. So I know in the run-up to DevOps, I'm probably going to be working late. So it's actually rather predictable about how it works. And rather be cold for 30 minutes, uh, so I'd rather be cold for 30 minutes than save £500 a year. So I, I can figure out some metrics. What I've ended up doing is using a thought process that, and I know I've gone wrong, because I have a machine learning algorithm for my heating. <laughs> it's it's uh, pulling all the data about where I am in my house and when it should be on or should be off. No one else is going to do that. Well, actually, people in the room will probably do that, but most of the people out there that have bought a hive or a nest aren't going to do these things. And we need so many more data points that need to talk to each other. But it's almost there. It's tantalizingly close that I can leave my office cold during the night because it doesn't need to be. Why am I heating my bedroom during the day? I just want it warm by the time I go to bed. That's all. And actually, I like my bedroom cooler than I like the rest of my house. Otherwise, I'm too hot. My wife would disagree, but then we can just have wars over what setting we put. The biggest issue I have is that with Alexa, uh, my heating system is called Receiver, which is apparently hard-coded into the system. I have to say, Alexa, set the receiver to 20 degrees. No, no one's going to do that in my house, other than the person who knows. And I now actually have to have instruction cards about how to talk to my house. 
there's something's gone wrong. I, I, I don't, I fear about the path I've taken because this feels like I shouldn't be asking people to talk to my house in an unintuitive way. So we need to get it much smarter first. Um, oh, oh, but so far, 20% 20, 20 is what I've, I've roughly worked out that I've, uh, I've saved. Uh, oh yeah, this is, <laughs> I didn't realize, I've forgotten. Uh, there's receiver. I can't rename receiver. I would just like to call you heating or something, just <laughs> receiver. So where am I going next? Well, actually I want to uh, have the kitchen warm in the morning. I want to heat hot water on demand based on how much is left in the tank. Most hot water tanks only have one sensor on them, but you can stick multiple in. And so I can work out how much of a tank I've got left. I can also work out which shower has been in use. I can also work out uh, when a shower is likely to be taken. And all of this means I can do on-demand heating ahead of time without having to use a combi boiler. Uh, unfortunately, a combi boiler would cost me significantly less in time and money than uh, Never mind. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> my, my time's almost done, so I'll fly through these. But the first thing I get to ask is about security. Aren't you worried that all your stuff is on the internet? Actually, um, no. Uh, doing a threat model. So, so what are you trying to guard against? What do you care about? Because there is a mine of data out there, you are right. And abuse of the information. Someone could hack into my camera and start taking photos. They could. <laughs> there's lots of cameras around my house and there's lots of sensors. You can they know when I'm not there. I guarantee you there isn't a single burger out there that has hacked into your wireless network and is trying to figure out, are you home or not? They'll break the window. <laughs> that's, that's what they're going to do. So um, the great case came from the, the um, police of Westminster. They said that um, they've now seen people going around with electric car fobs, opening cars and recording and replaying. You can't record and replay because it's JWT tokens. So actually there's a bunch of security already built in, but it took eight years from the first remote open car to the first remote open theft. And so <laughs> burglars are still going to break into your house and steal stuff. And so actually, I care more about the data. And so I'm look you look for things that have got big security standards that protect your data. Don't just stick it. Uh, just Google around and see have they, have they sold your data. Some companies have. So just Google and find out what, what they're selling. Some people sell your search history. Uh, American companies are now enabled to do that. I don't worry about hackers, though. Uh, it would have to be either a broad spread, uh, target spectrum attack on my house, and I just get swept up because I'm one of the million people that uh, were vulnerable. But all this stuff auto-updates, so the risk is actually relatively low. Or it's going to be really targeted on me. And again, they're going to smash my window. <laughs> there are much easier ways to get what they're looking for. Does it make us lazy? Yes. But I'd say that's a good thing. I had this conversation with my wife, but then I explained, well, when I'm doing the laundry, do I consider myself lazy because I'm putting it into a washing machine rather than going outside and scrubbing it by hand? Of course not. Actually, these things are there to help make us get all, spend our time on better things. And so laziness is a way of describing it, but I think this is absolutely a better way to do it. As long as you're focused on how is this enabling me to get what I want done faster, and I can spend that time on other things. Maintenance is a pain. You will, <laughs> you're building a smart home. This is a better home, but it's like building software. And because everyone is developing their own software, it's like your house is in beta constantly. It really is a, an effort, but that's, this is the biggest thing I think we need to overcome in terms of IoT and uh, smart homes, is to make it easier to maintain and manage. So, the future. Machine learning and artificial intelligence isn't, we're putting a big lot of stock in that across the rest of the tech world, and I think it'll start helping here too. Uh, uh, so food is one that I didn't, I, I, would, I would love for it to, uh, to order food based on seasonal meals and things that I eat and do the shop. Why do I have to sit down and do my shopping? It knows what, I, most of the time I'm ordering similar to stuff. It's algorithmic how I'm going through it. Why can't it just figure out and buy that stuff for me? I don't even mind just scanning through it and going, you know what, I fancy some peanut butter, but everything else, yeah, just make sure there's milk in the fridge. I like bacon, so can you make sure I don't run out? Mmm, tasty pigs. 
Interoperability. We need to make this stuff talk. We have to get it integrated and work together with each because it's so hard to get this stuff plugged together. It's just the thing that you'll learn and learn hard and harshly is that this stuff doesn't talk to each other because of the security stuff. So it's good that it doesn't talk to each other, but that cripples you in so many ways. You have to expose the data. Be careful how you do. It's really hard to get everything to play together to do what you want. And now, I think I've got five different abstraction layers in my house in order just to get things to hook together. But it's fun. The user experience is the, uh, is the hardest thing for me to, to deal with when it comes to intuitiveness. The apps uh, from each vendor are all isolated, but they're usually pretty and quite intuitive. The stuff that's generic hits the lowest common denominator, and you end up with ugly boxes, and it's really hard to articulate what you're doing. You, the controls in them just aren't nice. And again, interoperability makes it really hard to have something that does multiple things across multiple stuff, which involves events rather than just actions. And what's your reliance on it? Uh, because uh, I've bought 150 devices, maybe 200. And from these, I've paid for vendors fixed fees. I've never paid a service fee. And yet, I'm reliant on Philips' goodwill to keep running their cloud. They turn that cloud off, and then my house gets very dumb very quickly. So I don't pay service fees for Hive, and they could stop, my, uh, they could stop me getting into my garage if they wanted to if I did exactly that. So watch out about your reliance externally. Um, yeah. Can someone brick your house? Now, I don't mean standing outside and saying a rip through your window, but it can practically have the same effect if you can't open your front door. And with that, my rant is over. Thank you. <laughs>